think we're going to go ahead and get started. So um, hello, and welcome to the Quora's Forum on Supporting Accessibility. Today, today's forum would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from Wiley, ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, the American Meteorological Society, Silver Chair, and STM. A little bit about Chorus. We are a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data, improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research, and host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. I am proud to say that Chorus has just joined the C4DISC coalition as a silver partner. By signing up to embrace their principles, Chorus intends to learn and really learn and embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion in what we do. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They will either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, free, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important, so we are sure to get to them. We've already had some questions about closed captioning. Unfortunately, we were not able to get that to work today. However, this is being recorded, and captions will be available on the recording. So today's forum will run until 12.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, and like I said, will be recorded for later viewing. The illustrious Bill Kasdorf will be our moderator for today's forum. So without any further ado, over to you, Bill. Thank you, Howard. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. Uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to, to moderate this session. Uh, a, few, a few kind of context-setting remarks for me. I don't have a presentation, but um, I've been advocating for accessibility to one degree or another for at least a couple of decades. And it's been very frustrating until the past few years where suddenly people are really taking this seriously. They're really paying attention. They're really working hard to get accessible. And that is just so great to see. Um, so why is that? Was there some kind of uh, something in the water that got everybody to su suddenly uh, do the right thing? Well, actually, uh, I, I, I attribute it to a couple of things, but one particularly, you, you may know that I'm a, uh, a big standards advocate. And um, back in the day, the, the, the standards for making particularly book and journal content accessible required specialized uh, formats uh, that assistive technology like screen readers and others were um, programmed to be able to use. And hardly anybody understood or even knew of those standards. And um, so that they did not get sufficient uptake. Um, now, uh, the standards for getting your content and systems accessible are really the technologies that we all use anyway. It's HTML, it's EPUB, uh, CSS, et cetera, uh, are um, fundamental to to accessibility and the, the, the whole constellation of W3C standards, uh, you would be amazed to know how much work and how many people are working on accessibility in, in the W3C uh, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, but there's, uh, it's, it's a field that's constantly advancing. It's getting better and better every day. And what that means is that, you know, publishers and technologists, et cetera, can um, make their content accessible or make their systems accessible with the, the tools and technologies that they're already familiar with. So that's a, that's, that's a big plus. Um, obviously the whole uh, impetus to focus on DEI uh, and now A got added to that. So we often refer to it as DEIA uh, is, uh, has been a major influencer in, in the past few years. Um, but one thing I want to uh, kind of caution you is, um, you know, I'm uh, justifiably accused of making it sound too easy by saying, oh, it's just using the technologies you already use. Well, it's not actually easy. It's just easier than it used to be. Um, 
And uh, one reason that it's more complicated than people think is that accessibility isn't binary. It's not like, is this thing accessible or is it not accessible? Well, the, the key is, is it accessible for whom? There are all kinds of different disabilities that impede people's ability to consume uh, print or print replica content uh, or visual content or audio content, et cetera. So um, yes, we can, build access, we can build our content and systems so that they are optimally able for people that need special tools to use those special tools and to get the content that they need without the content having to be altered. But uh, I'll get to it in a minute why, unfortunately, the latter still has to happen a lot. So um, one thing that uh, I've provided, I, I maintain kind of a, a resources list on, uh, on a Google Doc. And Howard, if you, I think that might be your next slide. Um, I wanted to just show you this and kind of point out some things that will be very useful to you in your accessibility journey. Um, you'll all get, uh, I, I can't remember whether you're going to get a document or links to this, but you'll, you'll all get this, uh, this thing. Uh, the very top thing is just an invaluable resource, an inclusive publishing hub uh, from um, the DAISY Consortium. Uh, they just do a tremendous amount of work to educate people on accessibility, advocate for accessibility, et cetera. So uh, that should really be your first stop because it's it, they tend to focus on, uh, even though they are getting into the technical details, they tend to do it in an extremely user-friendly way. So so that's uh, that's a very useful thing. So the first, seven, I think four of those uh, links are all DAISY-based or inclusive publishing links, the inclusive publishing hub, uh, the case for accessible publishing, which is a useful brief thing that you can forward up the up the up the chain to your management to say, here's why we need to be paying attention and taking action on this. Uh, there's an online course on accessible publishing concepts, and there's tons of webinars and other resources that they publish uh, for uh, on accessible publishing. The one after that is uh, C4 Discs tool toolkit for disability equity, and I'm pleased to see that. Chorus is now part of that, as are a lot of other organizations that people on this call are uh, members of SSP, et cetera. Um, one of the big things that uh, is, is, is a hard part for most publishers is getting proper image descriptions on your images. So, you know, it may be that your content is structured properly from the get-go, particularly if you're using, you know, chats and bits, which are common XML formats in the scholarly publishing world. Uh, those really structure your content properly. So as long as you're using those properly, you can then convert them into, you know, really good accessible HTML. As a matter of fact, I was part of a uh, Jets for our subgroup on accessibility. We're at, I still am, but we've basically finished our recommendations and they're out for review right now. Um, basically putting, putting out a document on best practices of how to use Jets to be um, optimally accessible. So be looking for that, that'll be useful. Um, so the, the next, the rest of them that you see on this slide are all about, uh, except for the bottom one, are all about how to how to get alt text right. And for scholarly publishers, that the one second from the bottom, uh, th these are almost all W3C resources in this bottom group, uh, how to get complex images uh, right. Uh, and that's something that's a big challenge for most scholarly publishers because you're dealing with things like charts and graphs and medical images and stuff like that. Uh, so next slide, please, Howard. Um, this DAISY Accessible Publishing Knowledge Base is just an invaluable reference. Uh, it uh, It is teamed up with what you see in the fourth row, ACE by DAISY, which is their free tool for testing an EPUB for accessibility. And uh, when ACE finds that your EPUB that you're um, testing uh, is deficient in some way, it provides you a link to this knowledge base. And that knowledge base describes in very clear, plain English language uh, what you need to do. And it gives you all kinds of uh, examples of code, oftentimes three or four different alternative ways of addressing that thing. 
So, uh, so that's a that's a big deal. And then the next two things um, are uh, really uh, pretty much globally significant and quite recent is that EPUB has become a formal international uh, global technical standard uh, as, an, as a W3C recommendation with a capital R. Uh, it has never had that kind of formal status before, but EPUB 3.3 was re recently published and that should be your guide to how to make EPUBs. Uh, accessible. And one of the documents, it's actually published in three parts, and one of them is EPUB Accessibility 1.1. So that should be your uh, your Bible for in the, the EPUB world of how to get EPUB accessible, including uh, accessibility metadata, which people are often not even thinking about. Um, a couple of tools there. Ace, I mentioned Word to EPUB is another DAISY tool that'll convert a properly styled Word document to a, a fully accessible EPUB. Um, there are many, many publishers now, and also some uh, a good group of vendors and uh, prepress suppliers that have gotten certified by Benetech's Global Certified Accessible. Uh, so those of you that aren't certified yet, uh, I encourage you to reach out to Benetech and see if you can get your, uh, if you're a vendor, uh, to get your processes certified that you properly create accessible EPUBs and uh, if you're a publisher, that the EPUBs that you get, whether you're creating them or your vendors are, that they're properly uh, accessible. And then uh, below that, metadata, the metadata in uh, EPUB, when, when we created EPUB 3 in the first place, we collaborated with schema.org, which is the metadata uh, associated with uh, websites and, and HTML. So the, the metadata the accessibility metadata in schema.org and the accessibility metadata in EPUB are absolutely identical. All the same properties, all the same vocabulary, which makes it much easier to, uh, to implement. Um, and uh, we've also done a, a crosswalk to Onyx, which is supply chain metadata, uh, so that the metadata that you may have either on your website or in your uh, EPUB, you can also express much of that uh, in, in your Onyx feed. And then finally, the last three are technical standards, but they're what most accessibility requirements globally are based on, which is WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It's now uh, in version 2.2. Most uh, processes are uh, now able to address 1.1, 2.1. 2.2 uh, is not a big stretch from 2.1. Uh, ARIA is a way of adding semantics to your HTML beyond what is uh, available in the actual HTML code uh, tag set itself. Um, example for scholarly publishers are, you know, what a, in, in HTML and a, a footnote is an aside. Well, with ARIA, you can uh, put an attribute on an aside, say this aside is a footnote, or this section is a chapter chapter and footnote don't exist in HTML, but they do exist in, in ARIA. So that's it for the uh, the handout. Well, it's not actually a handout, but it's kind of a handout. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, particularly on those last three and, and WCAG specifically, uh, most accessibility requirements and the one that most uh, publishers are obsessing about right now, quite justifiably, is the European Accessibility Act, which requires that any it actually addresses systems, products, and services, digital systems, products, and services in uh, in the EU uh, must be accessible to be able to be sold in the EU. Does that mean you can't sell your print books unless you have an accessible version? No, you can still sell print. It's only about digital, but you can't sell an ebook uh, in, uh, in the EU after July 20, 2025 without it being fully accessible. So that and section 508 you probably have heard of it's maybe more gov governmentally oriented uh, ada etc there are really uh, accessibility increasing numbers of accessibility requirements and regulations around the world almost all of them trace back to WCAG. so that's the um, that's the foundation of, of accessibility specifications so anyway with all that background um i want to just uh, quickly mention that uh Course has done a really good job of assembling the panel for this uh, event uh, because uh, th there's 
three speakers and they represent really good complementary perspectives. Uh, and actually the first of them, Stacy Scott, a friend of mine, uh, actually brings two perspectives, not one, but two. She's accessibility officer at Taylor and Francis. So uh, she represents the publisher perspective and a big publisher that's doing just fantastic work on accessibility. They really are, uh, they're a model for how uh, a, a big publisher can properly uh, properly address accessibility. But you're getting a twofer with Stacy because she also brings the perspective of someone who's blind. Uh, so she's got, you know, personal lived experience of her kind of career trajectory about how her, uh, the fact that she's blind has had such a major effect and the kind of obstacles she's had to overcome, et cetera. You'll, you'll really get a sense of why this is, why this is so important. Uh, after, after Stacy, uh, and I, I'll ask each of these uh, speakers to introduce themselves as they come on and put any, any elaboration. But uh, Catherine Miller is publishing services librarian at NIST, who will be the second one. And so she brings uh, a library, both a library and a governmental perspective. So I guess she's a twofer as well. <laughs> and then uh, Jamie Axelrod uh, is the director of disability resources at Northern Arizona University. And he's the head of the what we often call a DSO, a Disability Services Office. That those exist in uh, almost all colleges and universities. Uh, oftentimes, very small and very overworked groups of people that are charged with fixing uh, educational resources that are on the syllabus that aren't properly access accessible for a student that needs one. So I mentioned in the first part of my remarks that accessibility really is all about how does this person, given whatever their disability is, need this content to be accessible? Um, a DSO is charged with making it so when they get a not properly accessible resource. Uh, and uh, Jamie is uh, actually not just the director of that, but he's a leader in that field. He's a past president of the uh, national, I think national, maybe international organization of, of such groups, et cetera. So I will hand it over to Stacy at this point. Hi, Bill. Thank you so much. And hello to everyone. Thank you for joining me and the rest of the panel today. Um, so as you kindly mentioned, Bill, um, my uh, role is Head of Accessibility for Taylor and Francis. I'm also the Chair of the Publishing Accessibility Action Group for the Publishers Association. That's quite a mouthful. I'm glad I got that out. Um, I, I like Bill, I have been advocating for yeah probably about a couple of decades for accessible solutions to digital publishing. And and I am I'm also going to be setting a bit of context. So I, I'm not going to be sharing uh, too many slides. Um, I'm just going to be telling you a bit about my own personal and professional experience. So when I when I consider my my personal experience, you know, what I'm really thinking about is how I was limited by not having access to accessible digital content, uh, particularly when I was a student. So when I went to university, I started off studying your, your, your health and social science type subjects. And so as you can imagine, that involved a lot of books, a lot of journals. And, and I, I, you know, the image I have in my head is basically, if you can imagine me in, in a small corral type room, absolutely buried under so much paper, an entire forest worth of paper. And what I was doing was, was scanning every single journal and every single book so that my text to speech software could read it to me because I'm unable to see the content on the screen. The problem with doing this, and again, back then, this was a, a fantastic solution. It was better than it had been 10 years previous when we didn't have that. But the problem is, is when I was scanning, quite often there would be a case where I'd scanned the wrong journal or the wrong book, or it was upside down, or it was back to front, or there was nothing that I needed from it anyway. Or perhaps I was scanning it just to get one quote to finish off an essay. And so I am not exaggerating at all um, when I say that I was I was not the, the student that was in the pub um, <laughs> for their for their degree. Um, and it was extremely difficult back then. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to come to this. But when I look at what what where we are now, what we're talking about today, it's incredible. It feels like we've 
we've shot forward into the future. And so it, it is really, really positive um, and, and really exciting. Certainly for me, um, in terms of the, the, the subjects I was taking, I actually decided it was so frustrating and difficult with the scanning. I thought I'd make my life easier by doing a maths degree. And actually, I know it sounds bizarre, but it did make my life easier because I didn't have to scan any books. I didn't have to scan any journals. That was all done at that time through, um, you know, acetates and uh, your workshops that you, you did in, in class. And so to me, even though even now, you know, STEM subjects, which I'll come on to as well, are, are you know, very well known for not being accessible. Back then, they were more accessible. It was more accessible to do it for me where I could interact with the staff, the lecturers, and I could have somebody support me than actually scanning in, uh, you know, a thousand pages a day of, of journals and, and books. And so, yeah, certainly from a personal perspective, I, I, I see things have come an exceptionally long way. And I see this in my professional life as well. And so, I, through working with the, the Publishers Association Action Group for Accessibility, I, I see so many publishers, vendors, aggregators and end users talking about what they're doing, talking about how they're moving forward in accessibility. And it's really, really inspiring and it's really, really great to see. Um, we, we talked about standards, Bill has mentioned them. There are so many standards that have been implemented since, you know, in the past couple of decades. And so having things like the Marrakesh Treaty, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, uh, as Bill mentioned, Benetech's Global You Certified Accessible Programme, and also the European Accessibility Act. All of these things have meant that actually it's it's the whole thing of, you know, what gets measured gets managed. And I think that's really important. We're starting to see it, it puts it on the table as being something that should matter, not just to the end user, but to the people creating the content. And I think that has been really key in, in helping us push things up the chain to to senior leadership and saying, you know, this is something that we need to do. This is something we need to invest in. A, because it matters, and B, because we have to. And and for me personally, I, I don't mind what the driver is as long as we, we start to see that that movement. And, and we certainly have. One of the other things that there's come in the come out in the past 10 years is the ability to uh, share and, and access content across the globe. And again, this incorporates the Marrakesh Treaty, but it's things like if we look at Bookshare, you have Bookshare now in the UK, the US, Australia, Canada, I believe uh, in the, the UAE. It's, it's, it's so prominent everywhere now. And that is a place where people with print disabilities, so not just visual impairment, but people with dyslexia, dyspraxia, all sorts of different conditions and disabilities can access digital content immediately. And so to jump back to my professional life, sorry, and my and my personal where they combined, I actually then did a course in 2020 where I did it online and uh, it was in leadership and management. And I was able to do the whole thing by simply just searching for a book, downloading it and reading it. It was amazing. I didn't have to scan it. I didn't realize that, you know, it was upside down and I you know, have to try and work out how you read things upside down with, with text to speech, which does not happen. Um, it was an incredible experience and it, and it was so different. And to, to all the publishers who have put their, their, their books onto those platforms, I, I can tell you both personally, but also professionally, the difference that that has made. It is incredible. And it's not only that the books are on the platform, but the more accessible you make those books, the better experience for everyone. And so quite often I would find I could access the book, download it, and it was fully tagged. It was accessible. It had headings and it had alt text. And so that brings me on to one of the, the key thing, key features, I think, uh, are, is, is as important as anything when it comes to accessibility. So uh, alt text, as, as most of us will know, is uh, a, a hidden description that goes with an image or a diagram, typically short in length. And it can be heard by those using text to speech. And so it's for people who can't visually access that image. 
We also have what we call long descriptions, and they are they are slightly different. They are for more detailed explanations. So they might be seen, say, uh, for pictures that have a lot more detail or that are a bit more complex. So perhaps in medicine, across science and mathematics. And they can be placed in a variety of different places. So if you have a book, they could perhaps be uh, in an appendix, but, but linked to easily through um, from that diagram. And so these these bring to life the pictures and, and diagrams and images um, in, in a book, on a website, or even in social media. And, and they're actually not so difficult to, to add, um, but they make a huge difference. You know, they say, uh, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. Um, yeah, if you've got those words, though, that makes the, that picture completely accessible and can tell an entire story to somebody who couldn't see it. So the question is with alt text, if we're looking at you know a publisher's perspective, so who provides it? Is it the publisher? Sometimes for us. The vendor? Yes, for us. The author? Absolutely yes for us. Because who knows their content better than the person that's created it? And so quite often we will work with our authors to provide that alt text. Now, I'm not saying we simply said to our authors, hey, can you provide alt text? And they went, sure, here's some fabulous alt text. There you go. It took us a while, you know, we're still working on it. We've produced at Taylor and Francis a lot of standards, a lot of guidelines, a lot of guidance and a lot of support. And we're now seeing a, a real steady influx in the content that we're getting from our authors that we check. And actually we're finding that the, the percentage of content that is bang on in terms of what's needed for description is increasing exponentially as we go along. And so just by beginning that process, it has been a process, but it's been very, very effective. And we, we have a lot of really interesting and fantastic comments from our authors as well, such, you know, such as, well, it never occurred to me a blind person could take my subject. Well, sure, because they couldn't in the past because they didn't have these descriptions, but now they can and now they do. Um, I didn't. I, I'd never heard of it before, and and they and now I now I incorporate it into everything. Uh, interestingly, as well, we've had a lot of authors say that it's made them think about how they are putting across the information in their in their book to everyone, and so it becomes something that's fully inclusive. And after all, that's that's the aim of accessibility, right? It's the aim of making stuff accessible, is to create that all inclusive experience for everybody. And I guess the, the final cherry on the cake for all text is that actually it makes your content more discoverable. So for any of you who are fans of, you know, search engine optimization, then you, you absolutely would be wanting to use alt text, even just for the discoverability. So it, it really does offer a, a lot just to put alt text. And as I say, that can be in a book, but it could also just be in a tweet, you know, if your business is putting out a tweet and it has a, a, a tiny bit of alt text describing an image that goes with that, that you've chosen to put with that, then that's the difference between someone not engaging with your content at all because they cannot understand what you're writing, they cannot perceive it, and having a full understanding of, of what you're doing or you're promoting. And so it makes a huge difference. It's going to be very interesting looking at alt text going forward um, as we start to look at things like artificial intelligence. And I know that's something that that me and, and, and several other colleagues across the industry are currently, I want to say working on, but I also want to say playing with because it is it, it's incredibly entertaining. It's really um, fascinating, uh, particularly for me from a personal perspective as well. I, I can now use my phone and I can use an, an engine tap on a picture in my library and the, the, the level of description has allowed me to start sorting photographs into albums with no useful vision, nobody to help me. And, and that's something that I don't think I would have envisaged that even a year ago. And so sometimes these, these advancements can take us by surprise, but it's certainly a, a good surprise. Yes, there will be many questions from a publisher's perspective, and we're looking at those too. So in terms of copyright issues, uh, content storage, management, all of that sort of stuff, uh, how does it how does it incorporate itself into things like the Equality Act 2010 amended? So things like these are all questions that still need to be addressed. And I think we're going to be having these conversations for a while yet, but it's definitely very exciting. 
it's also exciting in the STEM content side. So STEM being science, technology, engineering, maths, and medicine. Sometimes I add that extra M because we are now seeing people uh, who previously, you know, provisionally impaired people who would not have been able to study medicine are now doing so. Now, I'm not saying that they're going to be operating on you, but the fact that they are able to study medicine and, and to, to be in, in a, say, a hospital or a GP environment fully capable is actually quite incredible. And a lot of that is because the content is accessible, the images are accessible. So um, with that, we're, we're looking at, when I talk about accessible, we're looking at things like being able to read the underlying math with, uh, say, text to speech. So again, if you can't see it, um, being able to have that transcribed to you so that you can hear it using your text-to-speech engine. And so with that, we're seeing that a lot of uh, content is now completely, has, has MathML completely embedded in it. And we're seeing uh, solutions come out now where you can then take that content and not only can you read that math, you can interact with it. It's not enough just to have an equation with some alt text. And the reason is, is because alt text is read in one swift way, one swift move. And so if you're just saying, you know, picture of a girl in a blue dress standing next to a tall tree, there's green grass and a blue sky, that's fine, we'll get that. If you're trying to describe uh, the quadratic equation, uh, which I do know, but I, I won't bore you with, then, you know, that you're not, if you're not able to interrogate that information, it's very, very difficult. And that's where we use things like long description. But also being able to interact with the embedded math ML means that you're able to, to, to really delve in and look at what that equation is saying. Because there is a big difference between 3x minus 1 over x and 3x minus 1 all over x. And, and so this, the nuance, it's so important that you're able to interrogate the content. So um, there's so many things I could talk about that are, that are, <laughs> that are important for me and for accessibility. But some of the key takeaways, I think, um, I would say uh, size doesn't matter. And I say this because I, I talk to publishers every week and, and some will say, we're, we're such a big publisher, it's hard to know how to get things moving. How do we get it up the chain? So what do we do? And then I'll hear from a small publisher that will say, we're too small. We don't have the resources. We can't get things moving. And what I would say is that actually to both, it is very, very doable. The key thing I would say is don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And, and I, I, in, in that, I also refer to the European Accessibility Act. That is a massive act to, to digest. And it's something that, you know, we talk about a lot. You know, what does this part mean? And what's the penalty? What do we do? But actually, sometimes what, we do, what, we, what is needed is movement. Take those first steps and don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't think, well, we can't do it all, so we'll do nothing. Start, start wherever you need to start. If that is... How do I tag a PDF so that it's accessible? How do I convert it into an EPUB 3 so it's even more accessible? How do I put it onto the likes of Bookshare? How do I, how do I make alt text? It's all of these things contribute massively and really change your content. The one thing I would say though, is this is when we're talking about making your content born accessible. And so what you don't wanna do is you don't wanna be on scrambling eggs because that is the thing that whether you're a large publisher or a small publisher or intermediate publisher, that is gonna cost a lot of time and a lot of money. So not retrofitting accessibility is the best thing you can do for your workflow. Because having it born accessible, having those, whether it's adding alt text and tagging for PDFs and whatever it may be, having it built into your workflow will save you so much time and money going forward. My second takeaway is don't hide your light under a, under a bushel. If, you, if you're doing accessibility, let it shine. So let it shine through your metadata, as Bill talked about. You know, if we can't discover an accessible version of your book, then you might find that nobody's reading your accessible book, which is such a shame because you've gone through all that trouble. And so making sure that it's discoverable as an accessible book is really, really important. But also don't be an island, you know, shout about what you're doing, work with people in, in publishing in your area, because 
in in my experience it's it's such a collaborative space everybody is is at different points in that journey and actually sharing that experience sharing where you are tips advice it it makes a huge difference and certainly the groups that I'm I, I steer or I'm a member of that is what we do and it's it's proven to be one of the most crucial things, I think, in progressing accessibility. And as Bill mentioned, there are so many good resources. So do take advantage of those. Again, don't be put off by the idea of boiling the ocean. Start where you need to start. Look at the resources. Some of them are bite-sized and some of them are called how to start to get accessible publishing. Like, where do I begin? So, you know, again, whether you're a big publisher or a small publisher, all of these resources are are absolutely certainly fan, you know they're fantastic and this they're so relevant no matter where you're working in this space and the final point i would make and i think it's because this is such an overlooked point you need a you, you need user experience and so we love our qa teams and our developers and they're absolutely necessary they are so clever and they have exactly what we need in order to make our websites and our platforms accessible but sometimes they cheat. And what I mean by that is they don't mean to, but I've sometimes heard that I've been in a discussion where they've said, oh, we've tested it with a screen reader. And I said, oh, OK, how did you do that? Uh, well, I, we clicked on it and it spoke to us. So, it was a, so that means it's working, right? No, no, it doesn't. No, that's unfortunately, you know, using a screen reader is slightly more technical than that. And so you need to have that experience. You need to have the experience of your end user. Their input is absolutely crucial. In, in From the very start, when you're designing content, think about accessibility and make sure that you are talking to your end users or even better still, you're employing your end users because they are your experts and their expertise is absolutely vital in this. So, as I've mentioned, I could talk all day on it, but I know we have other fabulous panelists who can also have talk all day on it and have so many interesting uh, things to add to that. So, uh, yes, I'll hand back over to Bill. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stacey. Uh, illuminating as always. Uh, and um, we'll move on now to Catherine Miller from uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, fondly known as NIST. Catherine, take it away. Thanks, Bill. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Miller, and I'm a publishing services librarian at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or as Bill said, NIST. Uh, at NIST, I manage the library's publishing program, and we publish uh, NIST technical series reports, and I'm also a member of the NIST 508 action team. And I'm here today to talk about NIST's efforts to ensure our research outputs are accessible and Section 508 compliant. And I hope in learning about our process to educate our researchers, you might be introduced to some more useful resources um, and have ideas on what else we can focus on as the, uh, the authors of publications, if you're a publisher. And as Stacy mentioned, I hope that we can all recognize that the work in making scholarly content accessible should start with the authors, the subject matter experts. Next slide. Disclaimer here because I will be mentioning commercial software products. Next slide. And here's a brief outline of my talk today. Next slide. So maybe the number one question you have right now is who or what is NIST and what do we do? Next slide. Uh, NIST is a non-regulatory agency within the United States Department of Commerce, and our mission is to promote U.S. innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing measurement science standards and technology in ways that enhance economic security and improve quality of life. Next slide. And our laboratory program consists of metrology labs, technology labs, and national user facilities. Each lab and facility produces hundreds of research outputs each year, some of which are used in academia, industry, and other federal agencies on a daily basis. Next slide. Our research outputs cover manuscripts, our technical series reports, which I mentioned previously, data and software. 
we have an average of about 1,700 outputs per fiscal year, um, and various teams across NIST are responsible for guiding researchers through the process of publishing, from writing to review to public access and to measuring impact. And amongst all these things, we have to make sure that our outputs are accessible, which for us, being a US government agency, means both Section 508 compliant and inclusive. I'm gonna be focusing on the digital accessibility or uh, 508 compliance aspects of our work, but I'm going to talk, touch on inclusive and plain language later in the talk, because I think it's a key part of accessibility that we don't talk about very often. Next slide. So to set our researchers up for success in digital accessibility, we have numerous outreach methods. Next slide. Because we have such a varied group of researchers who publish very different outputs, we have to be creative in how we reach them. So we have detailed information on our internet site that can be easily found if you simply search 508 in our search box. Uh, the research library that I'm a part of hosts a channel on Microsoft Teams called Pub Corner uh, every week where researchers can come and ask questions as issues arise. And we also have a forum on our internet that serves a similar purpose. Next slide. We do have policies and processes in place to make sure our research outputs are accessible, or at the very least that our researchers have the resources they need to make their outputs accessible. Uh, the policies include an official action team, which I mentioned, uh, with a mission and deliverables, um, requirements for all of the NIST technical reports that the library publishes to be in a compliant and accessible template, a request for all of our editorial reviewers to check for color vision issues in charts that they of uh, publication or manuscripts that they review and um, upcoming changes to publishing policies and web author requirements that we hope to implement um, in 2024. So as a publisher, as a publisher, funder and reviewer of research outputs, we acknowledge the two levels of responsibility. Um, so a publisher can specify a format, but they're still relying on authors to provide and follow that format. So to provide um, colors that can be seen by people with uh, color vision deficiency in their charts and alt text for all images. And so we're really hoping, NIST is really hoping to work within this course community to provide our researchers with all the information they need and the support they need to submit and publish accessible content with your, with your journal if you're a publisher. Next slide. We also offer synchronous and asynchronous training on general uh, Section 508 compliance topics and specific topics like alt text, web accessibility, and how to perform accessibility checks using some major commercial document um, authoring software like Microsoft and Adobe. Um, next slide. In, uh, in addition to educational outreach and training, our researchers have tools available to help them DIY or do-it-yourself uh, digital accessibility. Next slide. For those publishing research outputs, we have resource lists depending on which program they're using to author their content. Um, of note, the uh, accessibility checker in all Microsoft products, which I used diligently to make these PowerPoint slides accessible is, is very useful. And I know some people still don't know that it exists. And if uh, a lot of our authors also use LaTeX and there is a package called tag PDF, which allows authors to include structural tags directly in their text file instead of remediating the PDF afterwards. Um, it's still in the experimental stages, but we've been able to use it pretty successfully to uh, compile and produce a PDF that's, that's pretty, pretty well tagged and doesn't need too much help. There are also a number of online tools that we give our authors to help with building accessible color palettes, especially for um, uh, visualization data visualization programs or statistical programs so they can output um, images that have a um, accessible color palette. And you're probably wondering about this toilet image here. Um, so this is uh, one of the best examples that we found of how, to, how alt text can be used in a scholarly paper. 
Um, so the alt text for this image in the original article described what the image looked like while the caption provided editorial comments. So the two combined gives uh, an idea of why this image was included in this article. So the alt text for this image um, in, the, in the article is a glass toilet with an atomizer attached to the top, making it look like a sprayable perfume bottle. And the caption says, Eau de toilet, liquid assets, smelly spray has more refined uses than you may think. So that, that was an a example we used in one of our trainings and outreach, and uh, it helped a lot of people uh, contextualize this. Uh, next slide. Um, so while web pages on NIST.gov websites aren't te technically research outputs, uh, we do provide tools to our web authors um, that are really great resources for anyone looking to make their web content more accessible. And I think as Stacy and Bill said, um, the, the principles are all the same. Um, even if you're not publishing a web page, if you're just writing a, a research paper in a Word document, uh, the principles of making it structured and accessible are, are the same. Next slide. So our, our researchers have other supporting tools available to ensure that the whole research process from the very beginning, including meetings to discuss research, webinars, and any electric, electronic products and services they need are accessible to all. So they have those tools available for them as well. Um, next slide. So it's it's hard to measure the impact of any outreach strategy, as I'm sure a lot of us know. Um, we have actually seen improvement and growth um, amongst our research outputs in terms of accessibility. Next slide. So our internal web pages on these accessibility resources have been viewed over 4,000 times the last year. Um, which is pretty good for us, <laughs> for our internal web pages. And we've, uh, for the, the reports that we publish, that the library publishes, so we have the most control over, we've seen a 45% increase in accessible uh, publications from submission, um, which was just amazing for us. Um, approximately 180 staff have attended virtual trainings. And thanks to the efforts from our open access to research team, we have over 6,000 machine readable peer-reviewed NIST-funded articles in PubMed Central. So that's that's also made a huge difference in our accessibility of our research outputs. Next slide. So we've I've been discussing digital accessibility, um, but we also ensure that our publications, especially our standards-related research documents, are accessible by educating our researchers on inclusive and plain language. We have a guidance document for NIST employees who participate in standards activities that outlines how to use inclusive language and how to think about inclusive data in all areas of their work. And we encourage our researchers, all of our researchers to and really all of NIST staff to attend plain language training uh, sponsored by the Plain Language Action and Information Network. Um, I, I believe that truly accessible outputs keep these sorts of resources in mind so the content can be fully understand, understood by everyone, including those with cognition issues, English as a second language, or those just trying to learn a complicated topic um, that is completely new to them. Next slide. Finally, we wanna share this comic as a representation of our philosophy behind this work. So this comic shows the entrance to a school with snow on the steps and the ramp leading up to the front door. So there is a kid in a wheelchair who's telling the man shoveling snow from the steps that if he clears the snow from the ramp, then everyone will be able to get to the door. So we remind our researchers and everyone here that making your work accessible can make things easier for everybody. Just as clearing the snow from a ramp would let everybody enter the building sooner, using plain language would make it easier for all readers to understand your writing. Adding good alt text would help explain a complicated graph to everyone. And using attributes along with color would make it possible for a reader to interpret a chart or diagram that was printed in black and white. Next slide. 
I just want to take a moment to thank the NIST 508 Action Team for their support in providing this information to you today. I've listed all the current and formal, former members here as well as our email address if you want to get in contact with us. Um, thank you for your attention today. Um, and yeah, feel free to send us an email if you want to connect more. So with that, I'll hand it back to Bill. Thanks so much, Catherine. That's uh, fantastic work that you're doing at NIST. This is really, uh, I'll have to say, I was not aware that you were doing that much to that extent. That's 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 fabulous. Um, okay, we'll, we'll hand it off now to uh, my friend, Jamie Axelrod. And let me just make a, a, a cheeky comment that I hope I don't uh, offend Jamie, but I think Jamie would agree with me that he would love to have a world where Jamie Axelrod was no longer needed, uh, oh. but but he is desperately needed, and there are people in colleges and universities all over the world, you know, working like crazy to fix content that isn't born accessible in the first place. So, Jamie, over to you. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that, and thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel. I. Yeah, I think that's right. A, a world that didn't need me would be uh, the world I would like to see. And in describing what we do, as Bill has helpfully done earlier on in the presentation, I've I've now come up with a new way to describe that. And it's directly from Stacy. I think this is the greatest thing uh, that I'm going to start using. What do we do uh, with content? We unscramble eggs. So, um, you know, Stacy mentioned that as a publisher, right, you want to be looking at workflows that create accessible content because the time and energy and effort it takes to go back and unscramble those eggs is very difficult. But at, as that end, end point um, entity that's going to help students uh, get access to those materials in an accessible fashion, we are, in fact, uh, doing all of that unscrambling because we don't want students uh, hold up in the library uh, scanning their own documents. Next slide, Howard. So um, we've talked a little bit about this or the other panelists have talked about uh, this. Accessibility has really been improving in the last five, six, eight years. I think that is a wonderful thing. We're seeing a lot of progress. And in many ways, our need to uh, unscramble those eggs is a lot more related to a specific student's need. And we're at a better starting point with the content that we're receiving to get it into a format that a student can use. But not all materials are commercially available in an accessible format, although we're seeing more and more uh, publishers be able to provide from the beginning uh, commercially available accessible content. One little side note about that is many of the publishers, at least in the academic space, uh, like to do that and provide those accessible materials through their own proprietary platform, which includes its own oftentimes uh, proprietary screen reader or text-to-speech engine or their own tools. Now, it's important to understand that for folks who use accessibility tools on a daily basis, uh, they have skills at using the tools that they're familiar with. So each time we ask those individuals to learn a new tool for a new publisher's platform, that comes with a lot of uh, time and energy and effort for that individual and a lot of switching back and forth between the tools they're used to using and a new tool. So providing uh, materials in a way that the tools that are inherently used uh, by folks with disabilities and different types of disabilities, uh, they can use their tools. So what makes materials accessible? We've covered a bit of this markup of headers and other formatting features, alt text to describe images, notification of page breaks and marginalia. You know, this is incredibly important, especially in the academic context where students are asked to uh, cite and reference appropriately. And if the documents they have don't have the page breaks or the page numbers, or they can't get into the margins to see those footnotes, it becomes very difficult for them to do. It, and so in short, that accessible file replicates the structure of the document, 
in addition to the content of the document. Next slide, please. And as we've seen from you know the OSTP memo, part of what uh, they are looking for in terms of that production of, of research uh, documents and materials is to ensure that the semantic meaning is maintained uh, in that machine readable document. And so there are many elements that we often don't think about other than just the content of the document. So what, what are some issues that persist even as we see that improvement? Well, sometimes when we need to request the document from a publisher, uh, because it's not in a commercially available or born accessible uh, format, what we get is one very large PDF, uh, which we need to break down then into chapters for a student. Because in many ways, that one large PDF, page one of that PDF is the cover of the book. And so uh, exploring that PDF, navigating around that PDF is very difficult for a student unless we restructure it. And in thinking about unscrambling eggs again, and Bill and I have had many conversations about this. I think it was a little an eye opener for Bill when we talked about it the first time, is that often what we're doing is we're removing much of what a publisher has added in their workflow to get all the way back to that original Word document that the author sent in. So we're taking off all of that processing because that initial form of the document was the most accessible. We still see documents that are not appropriately structured or tagged, you know, as Stacy described, makes that very difficult to navigate, uh, makes it difficult to use in an academic context. The org organization of the file isn't re represented through markup, like headers aren't marked as headers. We're just using visual cues to identify what's a header in that format. The page numbers are missing or they're different from the file as compared to the textbook. So when the student gets an assignment from the faculty member, read pages 34 through 60, uh, their document, if we're not uh, addressing it, has different page numbers. They're going to be lost in that. The footnotes, the side notes, they may be missing. They weren't included uh, in that process. The formatting, text wrapping, reading order, Right, So we've got a very nicely laid out page with some text and then an image or it's multiple columns. And what we find is the reading order is incorrect. A, a screen reader or a text-to-speech engine is going to read all the way across the top line instead of recognizing those columns. And of course, we've talked a lot about you know those visual elements. Uh, maybe those aren't included. Maybe that alt text or that long description isn't there. And still uh, lots of symbols, uh, Greek symbols, mathematical symbols that haven't been formatted in a way uh, that are, that's using uh, math ML uh, to be able to convey that information to the student. A, a quick note about this, and it's kind of going back to um, Stacy's point about the more we make things accessible, uh, the more many individuals are able to use those documents effectively. So we have in our learning management system that we deliver coursework through and often, you know, documents and, and files, we have um, a nice add-on called Ally. And Ally is a tool that helps us understand what's accessible within a course shell or in our learning management system. And it provides the end user an a, a alternative formats production engine, right? So it's automated, so it's not perfect. But for many folks, this can be really helpful. So students can see a file that a faculty member has uploaded. They can open that file. And if it's not in a format that's very usable for them, they can convert it into another format. And it allows conversion to EPUB and HTML and uh, several other formats. Tag It will auto tag PDFs and things along those lines. So at, at NAU, we work with about 150 or 200 students that we know need materials converted for them based on their disability. But just yesterday, I went into our system to look at Ally and look at the usage. And in the first nine weeks of our term, I can see that over 10,000 unique individual students 
have downloaded materials in an alternative format to work better for them. And how many downloads is that? At this point, 38,000 downloads of those files. So clearly this isn't just about accessibility for students with disabilities. That's a big part of it and it's part of what we're doing. But also we have lots of other students uh, who would like to utilize or can better utilize those uh, materials in a different format. Next slide. So, you know, US copyright law through the Chafee Amendment profit, permits the distribution of remediated fires, files to qualified users. However, a lot of things, one of the things that happens with us, which is often kind of frustrating, and we worked to try and uh, figure out ways to address this, is that as an institution, when we need to request a file from directly from a publisher or a middleman service, uh, the contract that we need to sign to get that file so we can unscramble the eggs says, well, if you need the same book again for another student, you have to make a new request. And you can't use the previously provided file. We'll send you a new file and you have to unscramble the eggs again, unless we give you specific permission to do that. And so only those materials that we purchase and remediate directly uh, can be shared with those other qualified users. So what does that lead to? Next slide. That leads to a situation in which, well, meet Gilly. This is our guillotine that we actually have in our alt format production engine uh, office. What do we need that for? Well, sometimes because it's difficult or because we're not going to, we're, we might have to be asked to do that remediation and unscrambling multiple times. If we know this is a textbook that we're going to use often, we'll go and buy it. We'll have to bring it into the office, cut the spine off of it, scan it, and then remediate it. Another reason we might need to do this is we're having, we have a 16 week semester and we have a student who needs those materials. And when we reach out to get an electronic version that we can unscramble, we're told, no worries, we'll have that to you in two weeks. Well, this student is now waiting an additional two weeks to get access to their materials, which is really you know, highly problematic for that student in progressing in their degree in their program. Next slide. This slide is a picture of our alt format production office. And what it shows is two views of an office with about eight different desks in it. Our alt format production office is run by one full-time staff member and sometimes up to 25 students uh, who are consistently and constantly doing that remediation work so that we can provide students who need it, that smaller group of students, right, with access to the materials they need to be engaged in that process. And when we do this work, because of some of those requirements uh, that it that we or contract requirements uh, that prohibit us from doing some of that sharing or redoing the remediation work when we need to, we are in a consistent process of redoing the same unscrambling over and over again. And not only are we doing that here at our office, uh, our colleagues around the country are doing the exact same thing, oftentimes with many of the same materials. So as we move towards right uh, publishing from the beginning, from the workflow, born accessible documents, all of this work uh, begins to shrink, begins to narrow, and hopefully at some point uh, can go away. Next slide. Why can it go away? Because... Sorry, I shouldn't, I guess, have advanced this to the next slide quite yet, Howard. Why, why can that go away, right? Because now students have what they need uh, to engage and participate right from the start. And I know one, one last sort of comment that I wanted to share. I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion about helping authors, right, do a lot of the accessibility work and create their own alt text, create their own long description. That's incredibly important. A lot of times what happens is our student workers are engaged with materials in highly advanced fields, and there's no alt text or no long description. They're certainly not in a position to create accurate and semantically uh, accurate 
descriptions for that. I recently had a meeting with our vice president for research to talk about the OSTP memo and our plans for moving forward and creating accessible content. He's a really good person. He's really behind accessibility. And when we talked about it, his response was, oh, I wasn't too concerned because the publishers are just gonna do that work. Our researchers are not going to be asked to do anything different other than submit their manuscripts. So there's still a little bit of a disconnect in terms of who's going to do what and who's important in that process of creating accessible content. All right, uh, next slide and I'll turn it back over to Bill. Great, thanks a lot, Jamie. And uh, I just wanna underscore that although Jamie himself is unique, I would never dispute that, there are people doing what Jamie and his staff uh, do all over the world, not, not just all over the US. Uh, and I really wanna underscore one of his uh, closing comments that uh, oftentimes the very same resource, the same book, the same journal article, et cetera, could be used in hundreds of different um, educational institutions and there are hundreds of different people remediating the same damn thing. So just getting it accessible in the first place or even more accessible uh, so that there's less of that remediation work is, is really so important. So as we're moving into the Q&A, the first question actually pertains to exactly that, which is uh, a question for Stacy. Um, could you go into some detail about the guidelines for alt text that you provide for authors? Because obviously, um, just say give us alt text probably isn't sufficient because they don't know how to give proper alt text. Thank you. Yes, um, it's it's a very um, important and detailed question. So yes, absolutely. When when we started, we were very keen to promote the idea that authors uh, supply the alt text, but we very quickly found, not to our surprise, that authors were like, well, what is alt text? But more importantly, what is good alt text? And so we it took us probably about, mm, I'm going to say about nine months to really get all this stuff that we wanted in place. But it's still ongoing. It's something that, that evolves over time. So some of those resources, one of the key things is we have a short description of what is what is alt text and why is it important? And so that's very that's the kind of the handshake to authors to say this is this is what we're doing and this is why this is why it's important for us for our customers and here's why it should be important to you and so that's that's a really helpful intro for us and it's also something that we you know we put it in our marketing as well so we do we put out articles we put out posts about our, our work with alt text and why it's important to try and make sure that we're trying to you know we're reaching as many people as possible with that messaging because the messaging is very important because otherwise you know why do it right and so that's that's the one of the first key step that we took the second is talking about what does good alt text look like and so for example we have a system in place that will flag up any alt text that comes through our system that has fewer than 10 words in it. And so that is something that's a threshold that's been set by us because it lets us know, actually, this has a very brief description in it, very, very brief if it's under 10 words. And so we can flag it and check it because we want to make sure that the alt text that we're using is effective. And so we talk about what what is good alt text? And so we have quite a few examples. So we list examples of good alt text and we talk about why it's good alongside the pictures. And then we have some examples of bad alt text and why it's bad. And so that might just be a picture says, uh, this is, the, when we get this, this is a picture of a graphic, right? Okay. <laughs> So we know it's a graphic. The screen reader has already been told it's a graphic. That's We need a bit more than that. Or it might just say, a uh, person with a ball. Okay. But also what we talk about is where alt text is relevant and where it's not. So for example, if you've already got, um, you know, if you're already discussing the particular image or diagram in detail, perhaps you don't need that alt text. If it, It's about avoiding duplication. And so this is in our guidelines. 
So we have a lot of instructional information to basically help give as much support as possible. Um, the third thing we have that I mentioned is the, the feedback from our authors. And so that includes, you know, a lot of it's positive because we want authors to feel positive. We want them to provide it. And so it's all the comments that we've had from authors. But also we have a Q&A section. So we have where authors have been like, well, what about this scenario? And what about this X, Y and Z? So we have a lot of different uh, Q&As and a lot of examples, but from across the board. So we have everything from, uh, you know, images and, and diagrams. We have HSS subjects and then we have a lot for uh, our STEM content. So whether it's math, whether it's chemistry, medicine, we try and give at least a few details for all of that. And then the final resource, which is extremely important as well is making sure that they know exactly who to contact for support so not only do the authors know who to contact for support but that our EA our editing assistants they know who to contact for support because it's it's very much a you know it's kind of like you know <laughs> writing alt text making things accessible it takes a village right and and so that that everyone in that village is important and making sure that they're all on the same page and have the same information that is crucial as well and so we have to we make we do a lot of work both externally with our authors but internally with our editing assistants and anyone involved in the process to make sure that they also understand this is good old text this is why we do it this is why we want authors to provide it this is who it helps and this is why it's so important and so having all those resources helpfully in one place it gives that author that space they can go to where they know that they're going to be fully supported in that and so yeah we're always we're always building it we're always increasing it and as we go along and learning from our authors and from from our end users in terms of you know what they need from their alt text and so it's always evolving but i wouldn't genuinely wouldn't say it's at it's at a rate that it's you know of such high capacity it's crushing us all under the weight of the amount of work that's needed it's a slow and steady trickle but it's a very important slow and steady trickle and it's building up this library of useful resources that is then informing our authors to build up their library and our library of uh, fully accessible uh, images with alt text that is meaningful and that can be replicated and used. I hope that's helpful. Very helpful, thank you. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I hope you don't mind that I add some comments because I've already Please. got some extra comments to make. Um, I really want to emphasize something that you brought in uh, late in your comments uh, that I I really stress uh, over and over again is publishers edit. You have editors, right? It's important for the editors to know what good alt text is because um, yes, absolutely. You know, one of the uh, one of the comments I made in, in my introduction was, you know, how important it is to get uh, get things born accessible, get them up front. Well, that's not just when the finished publication goes out to, to the market, but it's even upstream in your workflow. The earlier you can get things right, the better. So, you know, the, the, I often, uh, you know, clients of mine often think, well, this is a production issue. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with editorial, does it? Yes, it does. There's lots yeah. that an editor can contribute, so it gets right before it even gets to production, and that includes editing that alt text. And then one other comment I want to make that I wish I didn't have to make, but I'm just going to point out some ways that people cheat, and I, at least I'm not the first person to use the word cheat in this session. But you don't just repeat the caption because the the user of the screen read the screen reader has already announced the caption to the user. It's very annoying for them to hear it again. And besides that, the, the caption typically identifies the image. It doesn't describe the image. Those are two different things. Um, and uh, I encountered at one point, uh, one of the, actually a leading journal host who was really pleased that they just automated the alt text because they just put the file name or the path in the alt text and now there's alt text it's like uh, imagine that getting read to somebody don't do that <laughs> okay I'll, i will well, quit ranting but, well i would uh, just kind of add on to just follow on please. to that 
comment and, and to Stacy's comment. So I really, we do appreciate the slow and steady trickle and building that up over time is really helpful. Uh, I just want to keep that momentum going and remind folks that while that slow and steady trickle is flowing, um, we are also on our end consistently having to do that right in the now uh, for, for students. So um, that slow and steady trickle, excellent, really getting us down the road. But there's, it also requires lots of work uh, to, to happen in the moment um, to get students what it is that what that they need. And, you know, alt text is, is just one sort of aspect of that, which is, you know, critically important. Catherine, any comments from you? I didn't mean to monopolize the conversation here. No, no. I mean, just the uh, building up a resource list, like Stacy was saying, of uh, tools for both people reviewing and editing and the authors is, is important to us too. So uh, we also have internal lists that I'm continually adding to for all texts, especially because that seems to be where we get the most questions from researchers. So. That's great. And as an example of the, you know, their publishers, I'm, I, I often point to Taylor and Francis because they've been in the, in the vanguard of getting this right, but um, they're working at it. They're, they're providing Im important documentation and guidance, et cetera. That's, that's really important. One reason that I've felt uh, permitted to, to, as moderator to continue to blab is there's really only one more question because even though it's from a couple of different people, but it's for you, Jamie, uh, is to talk more about Ally. And I believe that's something that might be a feature of your spe specific proprietary LMS, if I'm not mistaken, or is that an internally created system? Yeah. So talk more about that, please. Yeah, so uh, Ally is actual actually a digital accessibility tool uh, that was created by as a plugin for the most common LMSs, learning management systems used in post-secondary ed and, and also um, secondary and elementary to you know, deliver online uh, course content materials and, and activities. So it was developed by uh, a team in Scandinavia and uh, it's probably been eight, nine years ago, uh, Blackboard purchased it and it is a, a Blackboard asset, but it is something that can be used across many of the most common learning management systems. It was originally designed for Canvas, uh, but then uh, it, be, it was built out to be able to integrate into many accessibility systems. So one of the things that it does is it, it scans content. Uh, it helps give a WYSIWYG for creating content to ensure all that, that accessibility. Uh, it gives... Uh, it gives information to content creators within the LMS about the accessibility of their content or, or their course shell. It evaluates any exterior external materials that have been uploaded like documents or files, anything like that. It will al alert faculty members to, hey, you have an image here that is needs alt text. <laughs> Here's some information about how to do that. Here's a tool for adding the alt text directly in. But, but one of the other features that it has is an alternative format generator. Now, as most of us know, automatic alternative format generators, you know, they're helpful. They're not uh, perfect. Uh, they get a lot of things wrong. And if you have a terrible file for them to uh, remediate alter automatically, uh, they don't give you a lot of sort of good output, right? Kind of garbage in garbage out. So uh, it, it, it's a helpful tool and it is something that can be used for for many folks to get a much more usable uh, document. Some, some of the formats are things that you might not think of sort of in a typical publishing workflow or one of the formats uh, creates uh, some formatting on the page that's through a system called Beeline Reader. So for folks who might have difficulty uh, visually tracking across a line of text, it creates some background contrast that allows the person to track across that line and then transition to the next line, right? So they're not in a situation where they're looping back across sort of the same line of content over and over again. It creates uh, EPUB 
documents. Like I said, it can scan and OCR uh, image files that have been uploaded. So I mean, it's in, you know, a non OCR image file of text and it can do, a, you know, a halfway decent job depending upon what the original file looks like. So it, it lives behind, you know, a, a login, it's in the LMS and we see more adoption of tools like this. The, the issue becomes that for students that the accuracy is critically important in their access to the, those materials, it's not accurate enough to use as right an all-encompassing uh, solution in where we don't have to be unscrambling some of those eggs. So, uh, you know, it's a nice tool. And I think the example that I gave of how frequently it gets used is just sort of an interesting side note to show that accessibility does benefit so many people. Great. Thank you, Jamie. And um, my notes say that I'm supposed to turn this back to Howard at 20 after 12, and that's what it is. But it also says that he needs five minutes. So uh, there is another question, and I think I want to at least briefly address it because it's about how to ensure equitable access to the research outputs. Um, in my experience, one of the one of the problems we have uh, in, in, in educating people about this is the confusion between access in the context of open access and accessible, which is the nature of the content itself, not how it's delivered. Um, but they're clearly related. So does, do any of the panelists have comments on this equitable access question? Because obviously that's a super important question as well. I'll just say something. <laughs> Because I um I I also agree that accessibility we are and I said in my talk focusing on digital accessibility but um, for something to be fully accessible um, we have to think about the other three you know letters in that DEIA um, I mean as a government uh, agency our work has to be uh, um, accessible except I'm using it interchangeably again it has to be uh, publicly available. Um, within uh, certain time frames. So that's our big focus in the library is making sure that everything that is funded by us um, is available to the public and easy to find. Um, so from my perspective, it's a no brainer, right? That's easy, it's an easy decision, but I know it's different for, for publishers and other, um, but that's a big focus of, of making things accessible for us at, at NIST. Yeah. And, you know, I guess one quick comment. Well, Stacey, you look like maybe you were about to say something. Oh, no, go ahead. No. Okay. Um, you know, obviously to a commercial publisher that basically, you know, that's how they make their money is subscriptions or sales of books, et cetera. Um, a really important thing that uh, a number of us have said in this is that uh, there is a legal copyright exemption for qualified recipients. That means a person who cannot consume the commercially available product as is. Um, they, they are entitled to get access to uh, an accessible version of that content. So even things that are behind paywalls or books that are you know, commercially available for sale, for somebody that has a print disability, they're what is called a qualified recipient, but it, that's where uh, organizations like Jamie's are so important because they are the gatekeepers on that in a, at a university of uh, determining, is this person that's getting this remediated and therefore free version of this book or journal article um, entitled to get it because of their disability? So that it, th these two issues do intersect. And I'm now down to five minutes left for Howard. So uh, unless somebody wants to get another word in edgewise here, uh, I'll turn it back to him. So thanks, Bill. Thanks, panelists. Uh, that was a really great session. I've learned a ton. Um, I know that we've got a long way to go here at Chorus. But I hope you all have found the session interesting and informative. And we'll be sharing the video, um, including captions, and the presentations in a few days. 
And so I want to thank everyone for your participation. And a big thank you to our sponsors, Wiley, ACM, AIP Publishing, Geoscience World, AMS, Silvachair, and STM. And everyone, have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks so much.